Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lay. We've talked about some great real estate books on this show. If you want to see a list of all the books we've talked about, you can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash books. Joining me on the show today is Nancy Brooke. Nancy, along with her boyfriend, own 15 properties that are located in three different states. I think this is a really unique way to diversify yourself, but I I also think it it brings on a lot of different challenges, like how do you find properties and how do you manage properties when you're so far away? So I want to find out exactly what she's doing. Uh, Nancy, welcome to the show. Was this your plan all along? Did did you plan on o- on owning properties in different states, or did this just kind of happen? It wasn't. I started off in uh, Montana, so that's where I grew up, and that's where I was living at the time. Had my single family house, um, and got the itch to move to Florida. So my first property was a fourplex that I was going to convert to my primary residence. Um, So basically the three units would pay for the fourth unit. Uh, Just looking at how I did it, you know, I might do things a little bit differently now, Dan. Uh, Definitely not the kind of return on investment that I'm getting with other properties, but for what I was trying to accomplish, totally made sense. It was an MLS deal, and that's how I got started in Florida. My goal was to move there. Well, I wanted to make sure I liked Florida before I you know, pulled everything out of my house in Montana. And so what I ended up doing is I got two young guys that were just out of college or one was still in college. One had graduated. They were buddies and I had some rooms in my basement. And so I went out my basement. Oh, okay. Okay. And so then I had some people living in the house. And then if I wanted to come back, you know, I could, you know, if I was traveling, I, I could come back for a week or something. And so that's how I did it. I kept my house in Montana just because I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And it worked out great because when they were, I had them here before I moved to Florida um, and then they could watch my dogs when I was traveling. So kind of a win. Yeah, (laughs) that really is a great way to do it. And so did you end up buying more properties in Florida or do you just have that one fourplex that you bought? Yeah, we went kind of crazy. Um, So when we bought, it was, let's say, sort of the end of the, the bad time in Florida. There were still a lot of houses Um, foreclosed. And there still are houses foreclosed, but the market has appreciated quite a bit. So this was beginning of 2013. So about two and a half years ago. So our next property was a foreclosure property that we had to make a bid on. It wasn't, you know, a formal auction. You just basically gave your best bid. And we ended up uh, getting that property was three bedroom, two bath house, which we got for $48,000. So When you compare the price of property in Montana, you're probably going to get the same amount of rent for double the cost. And so when we saw these properties so cheap, we just knew that this was almost a once in a lifetime opportunity to jump on it. And that's what we ended up doing. So that was our first house together, um, a three bedroom, two bath house. You know, one thing that I I just can't wrap my head around, and we've talked about this a little bit on the show with, with some other guests, but when you're looking in another market, and you see a house that's $48,000, how do you know that's a good deal? Yeah. Well, you know, you have to keep in mind, I was I was down there and I was living there. Okay. And so during that time period, I had an opportunity to drive around neighborhoods, to look at a lot of houses. There were many houses we made bids on that we didn't get. And okay. so we were we were making bids on houses. Um, I would drive to neighborhoods. I'd have a real estate agent show me inside the house if I was interested. So I got a sense of the market. I would say it's really important if you are investing out of market, you don't necessarily just want to start buying whatever, you know, you hear about these Detroit properties that are a thousand bucks. You don't just want to buy a thousand dollar property without understanding what's happening. So you do need some Either you have to go there yourself or you need somebody there who can be your advocate. That's what I would say. So how did you find a real estate agent that would – I guess a lot of real estate agents are used to working with with people that are going to live in the house. And they're not always, um, I I guess, trained or comfortable working with investors or they don't understand that as an investor, it's more about the numbers than – than it is 
an emotional connection to the house. So how did you find an agent that that would work with you as an investor? Was that hard at all? Well, the first agent I used was the one I bought my fourplex with. And she was a nice lady. She was not an investor, but she had no problem showing me houses that I asked to be shown. So at least she was very willing and accommodating. So I would say at the very least, you need that. What I ended up with is after this first property, we needed a property manager just because I knew I didn't want to be managing you know, 10 properties with this very demanding full-time job. So what I ended up doing is my property manager is also a broker. And so I would have him eventually just go look at the houses, tell me what kind of repairs he saw, and let me know what he could rent it for. And so it kind of covered all the bases with that one um, real estate broker, which to me worked very well. That's really good. Yeah, because he knows the rental market and he also knows the the sale market. So yeah, I, I guess having a broker that also works with rentals is is really smart. Um, and you're still working with him today? I do. He's a property manager. You know, we haven't purchased um, any new property on the MLS. i just trying to remember the last one we bought. It's It's been a while. The, the most recent properties I've gotten from mailings. So I haven't bought any from MLS lately. So you're, you're, what are you mailing out? I mail out postcards. I mail out postcards to absentee homeowners, so people who do not live in the house, uh, maybe have owned the house for around five years and have at least 50% equity in the house. That's who I target. And are these uh, like handwritten letters you're sending out or is it like a postcard? Like what, what exactly are you it's- sending? It's a postcard that encourages them to call an 800 number. I have important information about their house. So I keep it generally vague so they call in. And when they call in, they get a recorded message that explains to them that I'm interested in buying their house. They can leave a message if they want. If they don't leave a message, I still have their phone number and can call them back. So kind of a kind of a win win, you know, for me. So, and do you get a lot of leads off that? Like how many mailings do you, do you need to send out to get someone to call you? You know, I am getting around a 10% response rate Okay. on the mailings. And you have to keep in mind, a lot of them really are not going to be interested, but you know, maybe one in 10 is either interested in selling me a house or purchasing additional houses. And so when you're doing this kind of work, you want to find people who want to sell and people who want to buy so you can match the two up. That's that's the goal. So you can find some houses for yourself. You can find houses for other investors, too. So then you're wholesaling some of the exactly. houses. To, OK, mm-hmm. OK. And are you able to um, are most of the people that that you're mailing to their their absentee owners? So are they there are other landlords that that have properties that they want to sell for the most part. Is that- Sometimes they want to sell, like the latest one, uh, the latest two that I have under contract and um, hopefully will close on next week. The one gentleman owned multiple properties uh, that were in rough shape. He doesn't have the money to fix them up. He wants to retire. He just wants to cash them out, buy a, sm- a trailer somewhere and be able to live on the money. So for him, it's a matter of he doesn't have the money to fix them up and sell them. And so that's how he got rid of them. The other lady lives out of state. She lives in the Northeast. And so for her, she just really wanted to get rid of the property and reinvest in the Northeast so she could okay. keep track of her property. So that, you know, that's kind of some of the stories that I hear. Sometimes people are in trouble financially need to get rid of their properties quickly too. And are, are the houses that, that you've been looking at, are, are they, are they vacant or do they have tenants in there? You know, the one, uh, the, the one, that owns multiple properties. He lives in one of them and he has tenants in two of the other ones. One's a, a lot and then he has one vacant one. They're they're in rough shape though. We're actually planning, well, not me, the developer who's buying them is going to demo them and build an assisted living facility on it. Okay. Um, wow. The other property is section eight. It's um, three bedroom, no, oh, four bedroom, two bath. It has a tenant who's been in there for years. The lady who has it has done a great job of maintenance, um, really have no expenses coming in. So it's pretty turnkey. Um, and it's going to be making about 20% after expenses. Wow. That is awesome. That is really it good. It really is awesome. I have a guy who's just keeps on badgering me to buy it from me. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to sell <laughs> You're it. Right, right. Plus it's got a big lot and I haven't checked with the city, but I may be able to build something else on the lot eventually. So 
I think I'm going to keep that one. (laughs) So are you doing the mailings just in the area where where you live or are you also mailing to the other areas? Well, I actually am in Montana right now. And the work I do is in Florida for the most part when I'm talking about wholesaling. Okay. So I... I have a completely virtual wholesale business. So you, you're not going to the house or anything. Do you have someone on the ground that'll go out there and take a look at the house? Absolutely. So I have um, a handyman who will go out and check out houses for me and tell me, you know, what repairs are needed. If I had something that was more major, I could also hire a property inspector for what's called a limited inspection. I had never heard of that before. I was an investor, but you can get a limited inspection property report that will just kind of cover the major items. So I do use him from time to time as well, but he's, you know, a couple hundred bucks. My, my handyman is, you know, just the cost of his time to get over there and check things out. And do you go to check out the house? Like after the handyman looks at it or the home inspector looks at it, do you no. go to Florida or you don't even see him? No, I don't need to see him. No. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, pictures, pictures are there. I mean, I'm not living in the place. Yeah. As long as, as long as, you know, it, it, I guess the other thing, if somebody's living there, you got to imagine that, you know, the house isn't falling in on them. Right. It, it, right. The water's got to be working. It has to have electricity. So if, if there's a problem, you're going to find out if somebody goes over there because the tenant will tell you. And then as far as getting comps to know that this is something that'll rent for whatever the price is, then you're, you're relying on your, your property manager to tell you I can get a thousand dollars a month for this house or whatever it is. You know, sometimes you end up knowing the different markets. Um, If it's section eight, that's pretty easy to figure out what it will rent for. So that's, that's pretty easy. And you know that it's, Another property in another area, if it's in decent shape, it's at least going to rent out for what Section 8 does. Okay. So you you get a feel for it. Um, you can certainly ask the property manager, too, and he can go over and take a look at it. Usually that's what they like to do. But a lot of times they'll just ask you what I found out. Well, what do you think you want to get for it? So sometimes I might, like one we had, we wanted to get um, six ninety five, and it ended up not renting out in the first week. If it doesn't rent out in the first week, cut the price. Get it, get yeah. it and on. So we ended up running that one for six fifty. Okay. So no big deal. It still was a lot more than the five hundred we were getting before. Now, one other thing that that I want to ask you about with owning properties in in different areas are your taxes. When you file your taxes, do you have to do state returns for for each state where you own properties, or do you just do one return for the state where you live? I do one return. We actually have two LLCs, but we just did a return for the state in which we live. Okay. Okay. So it's not, um, it's not, there's no kind of, um, hassle owning properties in other areas. It's, it's not, not, there's not a lot of, uh, paperwork or, or extra work at the end of the year. It wasn't for me. You know, in my accountant, I have a CPA who's also an attorney who did my tax returns. So okay. it was there was nothing else involved with okay. that for me other than, you know, you have to pay the property taxes in right. the state. Okay. I, and tell me about Ohio. We, we haven't touched on, on Ohio. Um, so how did you end up getting <laughs> involved with Ohio? Well, like probably a lot of investors out there. I am always interested in learning more and doing training. So there was a gentleman who was offering some training. The price was pretty inexpensive, and I had gotten to know him um, through his podcast, through his websites, through some other uh, vehicles like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, what the heck? I'm going to go to Ohio, do this training. I uh, set it up so my boyfriend and I went there, and they had something that was a bus tour. And they showed some of the houses that they had. Now, you have to keep in mind, most of the people who were on this tour, they were wannabe wholesalers. We were already investors. And so we saw these properties and we saw the rent that they were getting for them. And we saw the quality and we said, heck, yeah, you know, let's get one of those. And especially the one that we saw in person. And so we asked if we could buy it. And that's how we got our first Columbus, Ohio property. We were there. So we were there in person. Um, And it's been way easier (laughs) than the Florida properties, to be honest, because we have a pretty reliable ground crew there um, through the people who sold it to us. Okay. And how many properties do you have in Ohio? 
We have three in Ohio. Two we bought turnkey from this company. The other one we bought um, through an auction. Okay. And so the turnkey, that there was tenants in place. There was nothing for you to do, right? You just had to exactly. sign the paperwork and that's it. It was easy. It was so easy. So that one was great. You know, you pay a little more for, for turnkey, but you have to realize if you have people, like I mentioned, on the ground, who you can trust and who takes care of everything, it's well worth it. Even if even if you can hire your own property manager, which we've done with our other property, you still have to go out there. You still have to meet the property manager. You still have to you know, do the repairs. You might have some vacancy while they're finishing the repairs. So all of that said and done, you know, maybe we thought we were getting a deal. We bought the house. I think it was like 25,000 um, and putting, you know, five grand in probably in repairs. And then it's another month to vacancy. And then plus the first month, um, he charges the fee to get the tenant in. So by the time you're looking, I don't know that we really saved much money yeah. doing it as an auction house. So that would just be something for people to think about. How much is your time worth? So, and yeah. if you, if you're not doing it in the market, I really would say turnkey is not a bad way to go. Is there any advice that you would give to someone to check out the turnkey company? I know there's a lot of turnkey companies out there. Some of them are good. Some of them not so good. Is there anything that, that you would tell someone to look for that maybe would be a, 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 a sign to run away or maybe a, a sign that this is a good company? Well, I, you know, I guess for me, it was easy because I met the people in person and I was there and got to know them. So for me, that was easy. I would say you could ask for some references. I'm on a website and I get reference requests all the time because I've mentioned my experiences with this company. And so I have people message me all the time and ask me. I would also say that for those of you who are looking to do turnkey, you know, just ask your questions and don't just keep on hemming and hawing. If it sounds good, just take some action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people just don't want to bite the bullet. And, you know, one gentleman who kept on emailing me and wanting more references, I'm just like, you know, what's your fear here? Right, you know, just I told you they're a good company. I mean, if you want to do it, do it. And if not, then that's cool. But, you know, I've told you what I know. Yeah, right. <laughs> so at the end of the day, real estate does involve some risk. You know, try to mitigate your risk, but sometimes you just got to take action. You're going to make some mistakes and, oh, well, you just move on. You get a little bloody sometimes and, <laughs> yeah. and I've been there. <laughs> That's great advice. I mean, you really, you just, at some point you have to do it. I, I think a lot of people get caught up in that they want to know everything and they, they want to analyze everything to death, but it's like, you got to just take action and you got to just do it at some point. Exactly. Well, Nancy, this was a uh, a really great interview. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Why don't you tell us where we can track you down online if someone wants to learn more about you? Absolutely. Well, I have a blog and soon podcast at propertyadventure.com. So hit me up there and you can find out a little bit more about me and keep up with articles as they're coming out. All right. Well, Nancy, thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time and thank you so much for listening. My name is Dan Lane and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.